Thanks, Jen, for facilitating today. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jen Kretzer. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm calling um, from the Wild Center in upstate New York on um, contemporary and traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee people. Um, and I'm the director of climate initiatives. I know we have a, a small group here today. So I think, um, and we have an informal discussion that's going to focus on integrating indigenous um, knowledge or traditional ecological knowledge into the work that you do, I think is the topic, right, Gina? Yes, generally. Great, Great. Um, which is really exciting. So um, if you, maybe we'll just pop around the room. Um, Frank, I will popcorn. So just, I'll just call on the next, just call on the next person. So Frank, I'm gonna ask you to introduce yourself next. Sure, hi, I'm Frank Niepold. I work at NOAA and the US Global Change Research Program. I coordinate and lead climate education uh, and literacy initiatives for the federal government. Um, I coordinate now up to 27 agencies and two White House offices and represent the U.S. government at the UNFCCC um, through national communications on basically education, training, public awareness, and workforce development. Sorry, that was a lot. But um, let's go with uh, Colleen. That's uh, you, maybe you're not. Yeah, there you are. You're in. Introduction. What's and the then, prompt? Uh, introduction and then prompt. Okay. Well, the, it, just introductions yeah, and uh, actually, popcorn. and actually, since we are focusing on, on indigenous education and integration today, I think um, uh, if you know the native land that you live on or work on, we could you could include that. And if you're not sure about that. Um, I'm going to include uh, a link to where you could find um, the indigenous land that you are currently occupying. So, so before you go, Colleen, uh, I didn't ask that last bit since there's a, a moving prompt. Uh, Jen's you got this, this uh, uh, Piscataway and Con, Conroy, I believe is, is the, but I just learned that unseated lands and I'm like, hmm. Seems like the 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 finish of like you know what is I I didn't know the Piscataway lands were unseated, so I don't I need to do a little lear learning about what that means. Um, but anyway, but thank you, Colleen. Back to you. Thank you. Good morning, every or afternoon for some of you. Uh, yeah, I am Colleen Fisk. I'm the education director for the nonprofit Renewable Energy Alaska Project, and I am on also unceded lands of the Dina Ina people. Uh, specifically, I'm near a location um, outside Wasilla, um, and it's they call it Betna, which means among or between the lakes is the traditional name of the lands, which um, I basically live in a swamp, so I think that's a way prettier way to say it is like between the lakes instead of a swamp. And so uh, I don't know who all is going gone yet, so I'll pass it over to Amy. If you haven't gone yet, hi. Good morning slash afternoon, everyone. Sorry I can't be on video today, but I'm Amy Frame, director of strategic partnerships at Ten Strands in California. And today, let's see, where am I today? I am calling in from the, the land of the Tongva in uh, Los Angeles, California. And I, I will pass it to my fellow Californian to, to, uh, to Jim, to James. Great, thank you. Um, so Jim Callahan, Mobile Climate Science Labs. And Amy, you're very thoughtful. I happen to be in the land of the Anacostans right now, as in Washington, DC. And um, anyway, working with Climate Club DC and, and things on that. And let's see if uh, I'll keep it short there. Uh, so either Steph or uh, Balasingsijaka. Sorry, really messed up that last name. I can go ahead. Yes, uh, hi. Can you hear me okay? Uh, my name yes. is Bosika Gulmats and I'm uh, at uh, Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. I'm a professor of geosciences here. Our campus is built uh, within the ancestral homelands of the Nanatuck peoples, just reading from our land acknowledgement, which I have included in the 
a website that I am developing with my students called Climate in Arts and History, promoting climate literacy across disciplines. And just last year, we added a section on indigenous studies. Uh, so we're just starting to develop this. I was really interested in this topic and decided to join today. So thank you in advance for organizing this. Well, let's see if so now, Steph. Hi, all. I make it to about uh, three calls here a year for the last four years. So maybe you recognize my name, maybe not. Um, but I hopped in today because I am now, after finishing my PhD, working at an indigenous nonprofit. Um, so I live on Dakota lands, but I work with almost all the federally recognized nations in the eastern U.S., basically. Um, and I have to leave at half for a staff meeting with those folks, but excited to be here for another 20 minutes. And I guess, Katie, I'll call to you. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you, Steph. Um, thanks for joining, despite um, you having to leave. Um, I am Katie Boyd. I'm the Clean Program Manager. I also uh, do some other work for a series education and outreach some of my time. Um, series is one of NOAA's cooperative institutes. Um, we're based at the University of Colorado, which is on the traditional lands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Ute. I use she, her pronouns, and um, nice to see you all. Happy to be here, and um, I'm excited about the topic of conversation today. And I came in late, so I actually don't know who else has not gone yet, if somebody else could help me. I think Kari hasn't gone yet. Oh, go ahead, Kari. Jump right in. I'm Carrie Herndon. I'm the curriculum specialist for the National Center for Science Education. I am actually the odd person out. You can use the um, the native land CA to see that um, where I am in Limon, Costa Rica is actually not a historic land belonging to a native tribe. However, the closest native tribe to me is the Quebecar and um, my spouse actually works closely with them. Um, I am also sort of at a fault. I'm not cer certain who else has not gone yet. I think Gina is the last person. Go for it, Gina. I'm gonna say that, but I wasn't sure myself. Um, I, hello everyone. Um, I am Gina Fiorelli Duranlo. I work with Katie um, at Ceres Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Sciences um, as the Clean Program Coordinator, um, which is based out of University of Colorado Boulder, but I actually work remotely from Vermont. Uh, which is the uh, traditional and contemporary lands of the Abenaki. Um, and yeah, I appreciate everyone being here. I chose, I just threw this topic idea out there today because um, I was inspired a few weeks ago. Colleen actually had um, a really amazing guest presenter come in um, to teach us a little bit about um, her experiences as a um, Native person and, and sharing some of her culture and her songs. And um, I just thought if you get to continue similar conversations about how to incorporate those perspectives into our work. Um, so there is no particular ag agenda other than to talk about that. Um, so yeah, thanks again, Jen, for facilitating. Is it possible, Jen, I can just do a quick announcement? Yes, yeah, yeah, I was going to ask for announcements and then we can um, jump in. If you want to talk about the climate literacy stuff, Frank, that'd be great. All right, I jumped ahead. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Actually, it, it's very relevant to the topic because we held, um, so for those who don't know, we're updating the climate literacy guide from 2009 uh, right now. Um, we're in the listening phase. Thank you um, for the for the show and tell there, Jen. Um, and uh, our process is a, a robust listening process to really see what should come into the writing team, which are all federal people. And um, there are four more public listening sessions uh, available. Uh, yesterday, we held one on indigenous knowledge, and uh, it was a very different listening session um, than the previous ones, but but not totally different, which was lovely. But um, there's a workforce listening session next week. There's a climate justice one later this week. There's an open one tomorrow and also a, a mental and physical health uh, listening session. I think those are the, the four that are left. But the um, And then you can also submit your comments individually 
very simple registration process and let us know what you think in in more written form as well i give you the both links to the collection of listening sessions and then also the um the frn for uh, where you want to submit your written comments but um good news is we're getting a robust response we will we're figuring out how to do this but we're going to put the all the raw information available for what we heard independent of what we synthesize from it into the next guide um i think anybody on this call would really be interested to see what what how are we talking about that intersection of climate and literacy now it's different really different than we, how we talked about it in 2000 six, seven, eight, nine, when we made the second version. So anyway, um, participate if you can. Some of it I know already have, but it, you can participate many times as you like. Um, but uh, it's 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 really, really impressive how this is coming. The last thing is we expect to have this thing in a public comment period in September and finished in December. December, that's like wicked fast. But we're aggressive because, you know, shouldn't be moving at the speed of a crisis, not rushing, but not um, slow, methodical. So uh, that's what that's the update. So please can contribute, send other people. Um, yes, Jim, uh, is that a question for me or is that a, a next announcement? N next, I didn't want to get too early. Uh, I actually good. had a question for I have a question for Frank. Frank, has this info gone out on the um, NOAA's environmental literacy group, like to all the grantees and former sure. grantees? I mean, uh, maybe, maybe. I mean, you know, uh, I can put it out. I could do that please, if you please. if that's helpful. Yeah, absolutely helpful. I, I think it did, but it doesn't it hurt did. to do it again. I think it did. I think Sarah a while or, ago. Yeah, I think it was a little while ago, so it doesn't hurt to do it again. But I think, um, I yeah, I think they did. Uh, okay, great. I learned one important lesson at NASA. Redundancy is not necessarily a bad thing. I think that's a, a general rule. No, um, a lot of people want to scrub out every redundancy <laughs> platform, right? And I think Sarah, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Sarah or Carrie. But yeah, it was like at the beginning of the process, so it wouldn't hurt to do it again. Uh, and yes, deadline for comments, written comments is also May 31st, correct, Frank? Yes. Okay. Just making sure. Correct. Great. Okay. Uh, Jim, go ahead. Great. Thanks, Jen. Um, so, I, you know, we always like good news, more good news and things. Uh, this coming from multi-generational, but specifically young people, taking action on climate change, meaning uh, deliberately to be a model for that young people can be active and make a difference at the federal level as well as the state and local levels. Um, several of you are probably aware that our students have been focusing on the Smithsonian Museums and specifically the Natural History Museum and then specifically within that ocean, uh, the Ocean Hall, which is heavily uh, has NOAA in it, but even more human origins. And we were getting a lot of this is going to be very difficult. We made the changes you wanted already, but this is very expensive. And then there's just the Koch brothers, the fun, you know, the old funders and things. Well, we went back and surveyed and they changed. They have been changing them, everything we've been asking for. They've got a few left to go, but they are sweeping through and getting rid of the incandescents and putting them in LEDs in the Koch brothers funded, original funded uh, uh, human origins exhibit. So that's. I think it's just, uh, it just, it really makes our students feel very proud and, and, and doing things. They've since gone back and are locating all the incandescents from the, the outside that you can see of the White House. So, and they're happy about, they're likely to be able to have an administration and people in the White House who are gonna listen. It's time to get those changed. Um, anyway, the, uh, just one thing also, I think it's really uh, fits into this conversation that the power of multi-generational um, uh, collaborations. So thank you. Great. Um, checking to see if there's any other announcements. Oh, go ahead, Carrie. So this is just seeing if there's anyone out there who knows of teachers in the Tennessee or southeastern area. We're providing a free professional development on June 22nd, um, highlighting how to address misconceptions with uh, within evolution and climate change curricula. Um, Teachers who attend will, will be offered a $150 stipend as well as 
um, lunch and snacks, obviously, for the day. Um, if you know of anyone who has any connections in that area or might be interested in attending, please let me know. I'd be happy to share further details with you. Uh, I do uh, carry uh, Catherine Price with the Cum Cumberland uh, River Compact, and I can get her uh, email to you. She does a lot of work in climate stuff and uh, runs Youth Climate Summit, so she is a network. Awesome. Teachers. That would be great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So today's topic is on integrating and incorporating Indigenous knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge into programming. And um, I, as um, Gina said, we have an open discussion. So I guess I, we could start by just seeing like what, like maybe where, what people are doing right now and what they're interested in doing. So maybe Colleen, since Gina gave you a big shout out earlier and was inspired, do you mind sharing a little bit about what you recently did that inspired, I guess sounds like inspired Gina? Yeah, thanks. So um, for the last two years, I've been working with a UPIC knowledge bearer. Um, a mutual friend had introduced us and I had just wanted to find a way to incorporate indigenous knowledge more authentically into our work. Um, we write uh, a curriculum called AK Energy Smart, which focuses on energy efficiency and understanding, you know, energy, you know, energy awareness, so general energy literacy, basically, but really around efficiency, specifically thinking about Alaska, obviously, since that's where I'm at. And so it's written for Alaskan educators. And um, and we include as much as possible, like, you know, primary sources for incorporating indigenous knowledge, like whether it's their stories or poetry or videos or whatever that is. But I also wanted to make sure that obvious and we're all of us who are at REAP and working on this curriculum are, you know, white European descent um, people who have very different background. And so we wanted to start working with somebody um, and more than one, uh, ideally, but starting with this UPIC knowledge bearer. And so we are working, we've been working with her for two years, um, learning more about UPIC culture. And UPIC is a very large culture group. There's a lot of subcultures. And so she herself likes to say like, this is just my community. Like this is my perspective for my community, uh, but still obviously a great perspective and can be indicative of that. And so we, um, what we did this spring is then we started doing some presentations. Um, so we did a couple in-person presentations where she shared some of her work and some of the ways that we've been incorporating her knowledge into our energy education. Um, and some of it is really small. Like for example, we were working on a curriculum where students are, are assigned like different roles and they're going to be communicating in a town hall sort of situation discussing energy issues. And so one of them was an elder that we wanted to, she's like, well, don't put a cane on them. That's a very white person sort of thing to have a cane. It's not something that, that was representative of ours. And so there's really small things that she could help us do, but also like larger picture just understanding that and having her as part of that process as we work through um, either new lessons that we're writing or revising old lessons that were written years ago. And then when she came on to, and so then we uh, joined a clean call and she shared one of her uh, father's dances and uh, sang and drummed as part of that. And so just thinking about, of course for me, energy education, but that's a part of climate education in terms of incorporating that. And that's a very holistic view. You know, it doesn't have to just be kind of Western science. And so, you know, when I ask her about that and she shares, you know, I say, well, how would you like to incorporate it? And she shares a song about like the South wind, you know, and how that has changed and how that has changed over time and thinking about that as part of that culture and then share, being able to share that with others. So that's a short view. Uh, I guess, uh, yeah, hopefully that's what you're asking for. Sure, thank you. That's great to hear about what you're up to. Are there others that like to sort of share how they're um, bringing that work, for, bringing work with um, either their local indigenous people and or traditional ecological knowledge into their, weaving those into their programs? Jim, I see you have your hand up. Great, thank you. And sorry, 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 keep my screen down to keep the battery going a little bit longer. Um, 
I guess for one is maybe influenced by my father and how I was raised and where he'd always take me and see things, but also having so many roots in Berkeley, which I think was the first city to start the concept of Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, you know, there's been heavy influence on the people I've worked in climate education that at least for 25 for five years, it has been a tremendous uh, uh, influence on the way we've taught climate education. Um, so just, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to say anything that other people don't practice and, and people, you know, I'm just kind of bullet pointing some of the features of it, but one is looking things, looking at everything from many, many generations, many generations back and many generations forward, not this short term, what's the stock market going to do in the next three months or even my lifetime. Um, uh, there is definitely the, our relationship to the nature and our relationship to the planet as being part of it and having responsibilities and not being destructive to it. Um, I probably, this this is an area where it would be varied among different Native people or Indigenous people of, of, of cultures within a certain uh, a nation or, or, or tribe. Um, but it is, I would say that at least our approach is, it is not, to be uh, technology adverse, as in Native people aren't technological. I've, I know a lot of Native people will get very angry when the idea is, hey, we're just technologically backward. No, that's not true. It's it's a matter of using it very carefully, using making our choices based on those other principles, not whatever makes us the most money or, or takes over other countries or other people and so on. Um, and I think another another one that I've, I've more seen a name on, I didn't know what to call it, but working with the STEM for All video showcase, working with a lot of programs that study indigenous knowledge, and and also it's related to Mexican cultures and, and cultures south of the American border, uh, the United States border, um, which they call kind of awkward, but learning through observation, uh, uh, learning for observation and pitching in, rather than the traditional. Okay, students, you sit at your assigned desk, and we are going to learn you. We're going to lecture to you and tell you knowledge. But they learn by participating and, and doing experiments and working with the, the community. Um, that that's the nature of the work I've always done and, and been part of. So I think it. I, I just I, I think if you were to take away indigenous knowledge from what we do, we we just don't exist. So um, and we but there's always much more to learn from others. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Um, then we have Frank and then Katie. So um, one really interesting idea that came out of the climate literacy listening session with the indigenous communities yesterday was when we were talking about systems thinking, um, which is an important part of climate literacy, we really didn't get right in 2009. But um, there was a strong sense from the, the participants that that's a very Western way of thinking about it. And that, the, um, that a concentric approach for how we operate in the world with other beings. And I, I'm not capturing it right because I don't have the notes in front of me, but there's there's something different in, in these two different knowledge systems um, that is important in how we characterize how we think and operate in the world with other beings, as opposed to we have the atmosphere and we have the human systems and we have the cryosphere and it's just a very different architecture. And I'm just, um, it's intriguing to think about how we approach, um, you know, that balance, that, that, that polemic difference between systems approaches and concentric approaches. And I, um, we're not resolved yet, but I, I just, there's something important there that is um, rattling around in my mind and my being to figure out how the right way to, to to approach this. So, I mean, but, you know, I'm hearing. Now we'll see what happens. Thank you so much, Frank. Um, Katie. Yeah, I think similar to what Frank was talking about. Thanks for sharing that, Frank. I haven't heard that about systems thinking, but I like that, or that's an interesting view, um, and I appreciate it. Similar to that, on a different a project that I've worked on um, called We Are Water. They um, 
we were trying, I was on the evaluation project for that and we were trying to measure, you know, um, thinking about ways we can kind of measure the impact of this traveling exhibit about water in the Four Corners region. And we work with indigenous partners on that project a lot because there's a lot of indigenous peoples that live in that area. And um, one of the things we were struggling with is like, you know, we talked about trying to measure engagement, measure interest in science and things like that. And like, you know, there's the, even just the Western view of like science um, was interesting. One of those um, uh, instruments that we have used in the past um, for measuring science interest, you know, we had to change it like drastically just based on what the partners were saying around like, you know, it was kind of treating humans and nature separately to some extent and just the way that it talked about like being in nature was just it just didn't align with the worldviews and the way that they um see you know plants and animals as like um part of the same system you know all of our relatives and um and just I've come around to some of that thinking a lot more and just really appreciate hearing more of those kinds of perspectives so I just wanted to share that sort of based on what Frank had said but then a couple other projects that we've partnered with on clean and in various ways and are still figuring out kind of how we can keep working um, together with one of them. Um, one is the Living Landscapes Project. Both these groups have presented on clean calls about, but I don't know that everybody was here at the time. A Living Landscapes Project did a really nice, like they developed a whole course um, sort of at the community college and high school level um, on climate uh, that's based around indigenous knowledges um, and the, the kind of regional and place-based work. Um, and they have not only the climate literacy principles themselves um, that are, um, talked about like you go in to, to learn about the climate literacy principles through traditional knowledge lens um, and you have to choose which region every, for every um, time you want to access it um, so that's interesting they've also developed like a course that has labs and other things like that as well um, so I'll put the link to them in the chat I just thought um, this is a really nice project for incorporating indigenous knowledge um, and science into climate education. And then the other group that's presented on Clean Before is the Building a Fire. Um, this has been developed by, um, I think, a group of people, but led by Patrick Freeland, who presented about it. Um, and he, they've developed a literature review that, um, annotated a literature review that really goes into a lot of the work, a lot of climate, indigenous climate education work. Um, so that's a nice reference. And then they also have um, a map um, of, it uses the FEMA's national risk index, index as well as overlays it on indigenous land. So looking at sort of vulnerability, climate vulnerabilities um, with indigenous peoples um, and then um, we're working with them, like he's also interested in trying to build sort of a repository of resources for climate education, and that's something that Patrick and I connected with, and we're trying to figure out how we can kind of work together on that, utilize what CLEAN has already as a repository um, or in our collection, and um, use that towards what he wants to, wanted to do next with the Building a Fire. So that's sort of, um, yeah, that's just some resources I thought I'd throw out there that people might be interested in. Um. Thanks, Katie. Um, I can share a few things. So I work for a science museum. If, um, for those of you I've not met or spoken with before, and we've done a few different projects working directly um, with our local indigenous community, which um, are the Haudenosaunee, which is the six, sometimes called the Six Nations or the Iroquois Confederacy. And um, we've done both a lot of internal like staff training around this, like trying to decolonize our language um, and understanding, I mean, just how how in, how language around indigenous peoples has been like 
in a way like stereotyped and in a way like words like powwow for example or low man on the totem pole or like a lot of colloquialisms that are embedded in our sort of western language how awful they are actually in reality and and sort of we have done a lot of work around decolonizing our language we've done um staff um field trips um to um the local there's a six nations iroquois cultural center the native north american traveling college aquasasne cultural center so we've gone on staff field trips and service trips um we've done um uh brought in speakers to talk about like things like the impact of Indian residential schools, um, the traditions of the Haudenosaunee people. We've organized social dances with, um, you know, so this has all been in, internal. So we did a lot, we've done a lot of internal work around this. Um, we've also have a, a sort of standard practice of opening events and meetings now uh, with a land acknowledgement. And we're hoping to have like a more permanent engraved land acknowledgement at some point and that's been co-created with the center for native people and peoples in the environment out of syracuse um and then from an exhibition standpoint we've been working on we did like a whole project where we took down one exhibit that's on um like a living river and we took down all the western science interpretation and we got funding through imls to do a rethinking of um interpreting that through the the Haudenosaunee lens and they were and the artists that we brought in could choose any topic and he chose the Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving address so that's a now new permanent exhibition and there's videos and stuff of him explaining what it is and interpreting in the first person so it's not our staff who tend to be um all you know non-native people talking about it but you can really hear from um dave um who's our, who's our partner and, and friend and he now actually sits on our board so we even now have a have a board member who um is coming with that perspective so we've been trying to do that a lot from a programmatic and on the floor standpoint and with our youth climate programs we've been really intentional around making sure that we have um indigenous people opening up our um opening up our summits opening um having workshops perhaps making sure that there's an opportunity to hear both western and uh, Western approaches to climate solutions and indigenous pro approaches to climate solutions, but really based on where we are here in the northern Adirondacks. And we encourage our summit sites, which are youth summit sites, which are around the globe, to also be making these considerations for bringing in that um, indigenous knowledge space. So anyway, that's those are some of the things that we've been we've been working on. Um, one of the folks that really helped us or groups that really helped us understand um, how to do this better and that works with science museums and with organizations, other organizations and agencies is the Indigenous um, Education Institute. And they actually are leading a whole project with NASA for the it's not the eclipse for next April, but it's whatever big celestial event is happening October, I believe October 15th. There's some it's big another solar eclipse. Another solar eclipse. Okay. Not the totality one, but a different to a different one. So it is gonna be a totality in some oh, okay. areas, but the, not for the majority of the United States. Okay, so they're working on it with NASA in Navajo land. So anyway, they're amazing people, uh, Nancy Mary Boy and David Begay, um, who are both, um, Nancy is a um, Cherokee and Navajo elder, and David is a Navajo elder um, that sort of co-lead um, that project and work. And we, they were advisors for us on on our work in our partnership developing and it took years i mean it took way more time than sort of our the way in which we um people that grew up in western ways like think about time and transaction transactional relationships like it was very about much about relationships and sharing meals and like spending time with each other it's a just a really different approach and it was a real learning experience i think for all the staff that were super engaged um and then the other person i'll just point to and, and maybe you've all heard of her is robin kimmerer who um was recently um uh um what was the big prize she just won a giant the giant award um but she's amazing so she, MacArthur, 
Foundation. MacArthur, yes, thank you, MacArthur Fellowship, and then um, wrote the book Braiding Sweet Grass and and Gathering Moss, and and her um, her books and writings um, and language are just incredible. And she's also been an advisor for us on our um, what we call it the Ways of Knowing project. So anyway, so uh, I just I know this was a lot, but that was something that for us really by partnering with our local indigenous community and making like huge efforts to go and like invite invite and be at the table and like recognizing the need for our museum to like to to create and make space was a priority but we had to be very very intentional about it and we had to have a really open heart like that was it was so much about connecting by through our hearts i felt like it was um it was really beautiful it's like one of the the most Im impactful partnerships i've ever been a part of and still am a part of so i i just wanted to share that experience I'm curious about others that are working in this space, like, or, or the work that you're doing, what, what that's look like. Um, Katie maybe can speak to this better than I can, but I think we've been trying to be really intentional lately about um, ingesting more resources into the clean collection that have an indigenous focus. Um, <clears throat> and we, there's certainly probably more work to do there, but um, we usually just come across resources and that's how they get ingested or people send them to us um, or, you know, if we see them. Um, and so I think we've just been trying to be more intentional about including that resources that have that perspective and tell those stories. Um, and oh, we have quite a few now, Katie. We're definitely room to grow, but. Always room to grow. But yeah, I was actually working with Patrick to try to, um, for a presentation he did to Haskell, um, University in Kansas, well, at Haskell, I think it was actually to quite a few um, tribal college professor educators, um, professors and um, show showing them what was in clean. And I was like, oh, the ones I knew off the top of my head, I thought I could kind of list out on a slide. And then there were actually more than that, like quite a few more than that. And I was like, wow, I can only sort of list like 10 of these. And I think I found like 30 or something like that, um, that I just didn't want to list all of them and was just like, here's how you search. But now because of that, I'm like, well, I did a search, like a text search. And, you know, um, we've talked for a long time about how we kind of need to do a tagging system for in general, like environmental justice type of um, topics or tags, um, you know, DEI sort of focus. And on top of that, you know, this indigenous knowledge. Um, and we've been working with CERC because CERC's been developing that at a larger level for like other projects as well. So we're kind of working with them on how that's going to be implemented, but then like also have to go back through 800 resources and <laughs> try to take. So we're just trying to figure out how we're going to like actually do that. But that is another big step I've been trying to work on. Um, for a little while here is that like tagging, um, tagging things. But yeah, we've been really trying to add more and more. So we got a bunch that came through the last review camp too, which weren't even in the collection when I did that search for Patrick and things like that. So um, I think it's becoming much better in terms of what we have in the collection. I just, um, Jen, is that, is that Shelly Valdez? Yes. Do you know Shelly? That's, that's who we were working with on We Are Water as well. Oh, good. So that's who I was mentioning really help, was helping us with some of our evaluation for that project um, and thinking about the language and what, what we were sort of measuring and things like that. Oh, I'm going to just put myself on uh 
I'm sorry to turn myself off the video. I'm having trouble, um, unstable internet. Uh, but yes, Katie, it was um, Shelly Valdez for, who runs Native Pathways out of Laguna, Pueblo, in Mexico, New Mexico. And, um, you know, that sort of whole approach to how to do evaluation through that indigenous lens is like so amazing and um and i know that there's been some really amazing work done through omsi to the oregon museum of science and industry they worked with both shelley and with the indigenous education institute you know there's a lot of museums that are trying to sort of rethink how they're doing um and interpreting native peoples and like in a way that is um well, that's like a whole other can of worms, actually, <laughs> but um, not can of worms, but like a really a whole other um, rabbit hole to go down. Um, but but really rethinking how those approaches. I mean, I guess I wonder if Clean could consider. I don't know. I I feel like it's is it like tips for educators working on indigenous, you know, sort of working in, in like how to incorporate indigenous community. Um, knowledge into communities i always i felt like i learned through our work that it was really best to kind of not to try to go and and um help el to elevate uh native people working in their own communities like indigenous people working in their own communities and that those stories are coming from them and try instead of trying to do some level of interpretation yourself but then there's also this expectation on 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 us at least here at the wild center that we really needed to we did a lot of reading we had book clubs we had reading we did readings we did discussion groups be, and did a lot of our own learning so we had like good questions and understanding before going out and trying to learn from our native neighbors anyway it's just like how do you approach that especially if, if someone's just getting started So are you suggesting like doing some of that work through clean, like through the clean network? Or? Well, I'm just wondering, I'm wondering about that. I, I don't know what I'm suggesting. I'm just trying to yeah. figure out like, like if you have a, have an educator that's coming from either formal or non-formal spaces being like, I want to incorporate indigenous perspectives into my teaching. Like what's the advice that clean is offering them um, in terms of, of, in terms of doing that? Yeah. And, and that's, at least on the, the clean education side, like we've, that's where, um, yeah, I struggle with this because we also don't, yeah, don't want to like prescribe, like most of us are white people in that organization and like want to work with um, partner to do that. And that was what I tried to do with the living landscapes. And I'm trying to continue with Patrick Freeland and thinking about like, you know, what would be beneficial um, for their organizations and how clean can, can work with them on that. So um, yeah, I've struggled to kind of put together a page like we have with some of our other teaching guidance on this. I did that with the living landscapes as like an example of how you can, you know, incorporate this um, there their project is a really nice example of that. Um, but I've been wanting to do a larger general page about it as well in our teaching guidance. And um, yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to kind of partner and make that, like you said, centering not my voice <laughs> there. Um, and then on the Clean Network side, I'll mention that like some of that work, we looked into that for a while. Um, I don't know if anybody else was a part of this. Reb helped lead the thought of trying to do some like trainings um, through clean network and things like that, but we just didn't have the funding to pay for somebody to to do that in the end for some of our like workshops AGU and things like that. But then that transformed into some of the strategic initiatives that we're going to be like groups could kind of work on some of those things and do you know discussions within groups. But that led into sort of the Excel summit, and it's all kind of been morphing. But I do think like that's something that you know if that's of interest to people to form like a um uh, what do you call it like a um affinity group um, of people who want to work on something like that. That's actually something we'll probably announce this fairly soon to the network, but Gina, um, you know, and the organization group for Excels has been working on what comes out of that and what are the next steps for that. And that's 
the main thought is a lot of people really suggested and liked the idea of having these kinds of like subgroup, like forming groups within Clean that could kind of, you know, have different conversations beyond just what happens in the larger network calls. And um, so they're working on trying to figure out how we can organize those and keep that conversation going. And I do know that that's one that people have been really interested in, you know, um, not just indigenous knowledge necessarily, but bringing ideas of justice and other, um, you know, kinds of that work into our education spaces. Um, for teachers though, Jen, to answer that question, that's something, yeah, I've been working on, but um, don't have anything specifically right now, except the Living Landscapes page on Clean. Thank you for sharing. Um, Boshlika, you, you, I'm sorry if I'm, I think I'm pronouncing your name wrong, but you just placed a lot of, um, and I'm sorry, there's so much noise here. Um, you just placed a number of resources in the chat. Do you want to talk about the stuff that you're doing at Smith? It looks really interesting. Yeah, I do want to mention it. Thank you. Uh, so I just put the link to the resource that I have been working on with my Smith College students, and we presented uh, on Clean a while ago. Um, and just the uh, uh, just to let you know about this resource, it is primarily um, targeted at uh, teachers, uh, high school and middle school teachers and students and the general public, and it goes beyond STEM. So it is mostly about uh, how is information about climate science portrayed in um, uh, other realms of uh, you know, human culture and, and history. So it's uh, for mostly for teachers who already, you know, you know teach these subjects and how, who may be interested in incorporating information about climate science in what they're already teaching. So we're not developing, we just don't have resources to develop um, um, curriculum or lesson plans. It's just a, a depository of ideas, of examples. And just last year, I had a student who was really interested in adding indigenous studies section to the resource. And so we have, a, and I put the link to that one in particular, an extensive list table of content for that section, the way that my student envisioned it. But then we haven't developed much uh, content. We have some content and we started working on it. And this is a problem that we uh, encountered. And I was hoping that I can get some help with uh, how, to, how to address it. Um, so I had students who are not non-experts in this field, but are very interested in learning, start developing entries for this particular Indigenous Studies part of the project. And then when we run it by experts, who are some of our uh, professors here at Smith, uh, then they were criticized very much about uh, mostly the use of language, you know, the words. Uh, everything was very uh, heavily, you know, scrutinized, and uh, and they felt uh, they wanted to learn, but the feedback that they got was not very. Uh, constructive. And so then we stopped and now we're reevaluating. We now work with a consultant who is a former student. Uh, she is, uh, uh, she works for EPA and is uh, uh, working as a liaison with, uh, for a group of Southern indigenous uh, tribes here in, uh, in the U.S. And uh, we're revisiting and revising our entries and then running them again by, by experts. But so what I would be really interested in is to learn about who may be the experts that we can uh, um, consult before we publish uh, any entries on our website, because we always want to have experts uh, proofread it and make sure that everything we are saying is, uh, is the best possible content that we can produce. So thank you for any feedback that anybody can have for us. And I see there are other hands in, in, the, oh, in the air. Jim, did you have your hand up? Um, sure. And, uh, and I, I'm sorry. I, I don't want to be getting in the way of people responding to uh, in, in discussion because there were, you know, the question just raised. I'll mention so, what I have and then people decide on things. I, I want to maybe ask the question about a fairly recent experience, maybe in the last few years of working with the American Indian Museum on the National Mall. 
Um, and uh, I know that, that the museum did things around climate change in 2011, but I'm not sure, you know, maybe some of our experience, I know it's always, a, it's a, it's a loaded, there's a, it's an important place, a lot goes on, it's very loaded, or, you know, there's a lot of uh, discussion within uh, Indigenous people. Um, I'm in a position where we have surveyed pretty much everything from the Washington Monument to the to the Capitol and in between, it's going to start standing out that we're not contacting and working with the American Museum of, of American Indian Museum, but I want to be I want to be very careful and very judicious and in, 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 you know, learning as, as we do that. So just looking for experience. And of course, it is a federal agency is this it is the Smithsonian. Colleen, you were, I think, going to respond. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I well, and so I'm wondering, um, you know, with these students and the feedback they received from the professors, was that something like the professors had um, some a rubric or some guidelines or something that they requested, or was it open ended for that? Yeah, I think. Uh... What well, the main problem was that we were trying to be really short and present information in the, the simplest possible way. And to them, because they're experts who know so much more, it was oversimplification. And I yeah. understand how, you know, sensitive uh, these topics are. And we want to definitely be culturally sensitive and uh, use best practices and how to communicate this information. So, I mean, things uh, like, you know, capitalization and the use of terms like native versus indigenous, uh, those are kind of easy to, to learn and then implement. Hopefully, this is why we're working with these consultants now and getting really good advice. But then it's also about the content and how content is Pre presented to our target audiences in a way that it is relatively easy to find and easy yeah. to understand because we know teachers need information five minutes before class and they want to find information that is relevant and uh, and uh, uh, done in the best or presented in the best possible way and they can understand and implement because we're not again developing lesson plans so that's a little bit more challenging part is what content to include and then how much of it because to an expert reading some of these pretty short and simple entries for middle high school teachers and students they, they may seem like oversimplification yeah, I know one thing I struggle with too is that oversimplification, but also what's relevant. I mean, within Alaska, like there's so many different regions, it's going to be so different what's important and like what's important in Alaska is going to be different than what's important in like yeah. Southwest US for water shortages <laughs> versus, you know, mm -hmm. glacier melting versus, and I know I struggle with that a lot too. And how do you simplify without um yeah ignoring those other issues so I don't know that I have an answer for you on that, yeah no I oh, I agree well. with you yeah. these are complex topics especially since yeah. our website would like to be global have global perspective so we're going to even beyond uh North America so it makes it even so much more complicated when you're using examples you can use just a couple of examples from here and there and then you know you're excluding so many more so it's yeah it's a big task that we embarked on and we're making slow progress but you know we're all learning a lot from doing it and hopefully others may find some of it useful thank you i think we have just a couple minutes left i'd love to see if there's any other final comments or thoughts around thoughts around this particular topic I'm so glad you threw it out, Gina, because as a as a as a topic, I think it you know it's really important that we keep talking about it and trying to find ways to be more inclusive. I'm excited to hear more from Frank about how that's going to show up in the the um, climate literacy um, guidelines the next the next uh, round of those. Um, 
on how they're incorporating or pulling through um, indigenous knowledge and traditional ecological knowledge into that. Any other thoughts? No? Well, I say thank you for continuing this conversation around this and thanks for uh, facilitating, Jen. Oh, sure. Jeez. It's my pleasure. And I hope everybody has a really um, lovely week and gets to go outside wherever you are um, and uh, enjoy enjoy springtime. Or maybe it's like summer, summer. I guess we're Carrie where you are. It's always summer, kind of <laughs> hot summer. Um, but it's just spring here in the Adirondacks still. So just the flowers are just popping up now. Um, maybe where you are too, Colleen, up in Alaska, or just barely. Um, anyway, well, I hope everyone uh, has a wonderful week and I guess see you next Tuesday if you can join at one o'clock Eastern time. Thanks, Gina and Katie for all that you do to organize clean. Thank you all Thank for you joining. All. Good to see you. Thanks for Thanks. facilitating, Jen. Okay. Thanks for organizing, Gina. Yep. Bye, everybody. See you on Bye. Zoom. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs>